Number 158, Pink versus Rome Youth Hockey Association. Counsel? May it please the court, may I have two minutes for rebuttal, please? You may, sir. Uh, this case involves the opportunity for this court to take another look at duty. And in this particular case, it's an important one because I represent a recreational league that provides recreational opportunities for young people. And I represent one, but there's many more of it like me all around the state. In this particular circumstance, all of the cases that this court has done before for example, the asbestos case from last summer, the Davis case from last summer. There's a balancing test that must be applied here. And in this particular circumstance, their unique circumstance uh, arises because not only do you have the gradient that you usually have for doing the balancing test, you have to also look at some of the social factors. And in why, why doesn't the landowner's duty apply? Why isn't this just an extension or an application of the, of the general landowner's duty, duty to keep the premises in a reasonably safe condition? Well, the landowner certainly in the case has that obligation. In this particular circumstance, we have someone who doesn't have landowning responsibility. But doesn't that apply to tenants as well, to, to less, lessors? If, in this particular circumstance, what the plaintiff is looking for is to place upon us the duty of security for these kind of events going forward. And of course, if you were going to weigh the societal cost of that security going forward, this court has already said and repeatedly in Custody and Bukowski and all those other cases that recreational opportunities are important. They're beneficial activities. But so I read it a little bit differently as to what they're saying the duty would be. And I think the Supreme Court was fairly clear on this. They said it's not a duty to provide security that we're talking about here. It's a duty to either eject or take other preventative measures. That was the Supreme Court language. So I think they specifically said we're not saying you should have had security at this game. Well, I think the Supreme Court judge said that. Well, what I would do is I would take it and look at it in a plain fashion. How else are we going to eject people if we don't have people dedicated to that type of situation? I think what they would, what the answer to that would be is, and I'm not saying this is the right answer, is under these USA hockey guidelines, you have an obligation to go to the coach of the teams to control their spectators or to eject them. And I would guess the hammer, although it's not spelled out as forfeiture. But so that, I think, is what they're saying. You didn't do that. And that's because, as in many other youth, facility, youth organizations throughout this state, we don't have people at every single game. We depend upon... But you have a referee. We have a referee, and the referee is the one who's able to decide what he wants to do. He can cancel the game if he wants. He retains that authority. In this particular case, he didn't cancel the game. He went ahead and did it and didn't have any particular disagreement with going forward. It was a hockey game, and maybe hockey is a little bit more tumultuous than gymnastics or field hockey, but you're still saying that for every recreational league, you're going to have an affirmative obligation. And I say that if, in fact, you do that, what you're going to do is you're going to require these recreational leagues to enter into a, a large burden. In other words, they're going to have to have uh, another duty. And if you lay another duty on them, what you're going to do is you're going to reach the problem of... What's the other duty? If the if, other duty... I'm oh, sorry. Council, let me just ask the question. <clears throat> if the coach can stop the game anyway, for for other reasons, what's what's an additional duty if there seems to be some kind of brouhaha uh, impending that the coach wouldn't just stop the game? Well, in other words, what you're asking the coach to do is to not only watch the game, but he's got to watch spectators. And of course, those are two totally different responsibilities. And my position is that if you then require coaches to watch the crowd, remember the underlying facts of this particular case is that the actors weren't involved in any of the dispute He's beforehand. So 
In other words, what you're saying is that everybody who's at the arena is a potential tortfeasor. Was the game Are you ongoing? saying that the, um, the Youth Hockey Association or these recreational leagues never have a duty to act to minimize the risk that spectators might get into a brawl or are about to get into a brawl? I think that they have an affirmative obligation if they're on notice of a particular pre-existing situation before a game even begins that there's been prior problems between this team or that team or something of that. Here, what we have is ambiguous testimony. Indeed, what if there's a fight in the first period between spectators and they don't do anything? Would that be different? I mean, oh. does it have to be before the game? I, I, I would say if there's a fight that is quelled and resolved and the game goes on, the game goes on. But if you're suggesting that there's a fight that causes injury and they do nothing, well, then we're going back to the landowner. Recall that... But if there's a fight and they don't eject the people who are fighting? What if there's people getting into, like, a physical altercation? Not this type, but... A physical altercation. Well, that's a, I, that's a horse of a different color, I would say. Right, and but of it course, doesn't have to be before the game, right? Well, it would have to be somewhere where the people who are in authority have notice of it. This is just like the other, where the property owner does not have an affirmative obligation. Well, to for, for purposes of what? They have notice of it and they're going to keep people out of the venue? Sure. In other words, what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to... And is that their duty to keep people out? That's as far as it well, goes? Well, I think that I think that's what the plaintiff is suggesting here, that now the recreational leagues have an affirmative obligation, whether they're playing in an arena somewhere or in a field somewhere, they have an affirmative obligation. And I'm suggesting to you that if you require that level of duty on a recreational league, you're going to all of a sudden increase the risk of <clears throat> that league's going forward. And of course, if there's an increased risk there's an increased duty that you have put on them, then, of course, how do we allocate that risk? And remember that in the Davis case, this court said, listen, we want to allocate risk to the person that can handle it at the lowest cost. So in Davis, you said the doctor had to tell the people, hey, don't drive if you've had drugs. Here, what the plaintiff wants you to do is, hey, every league out there throughout New York, you now have to control every single spectator. And if you don't, you're going to be liable. So there's a significantly greater duty sought to be uh, placed on them. And I would suggest to you that the social science materials that I submitted in the brief tell you about what the consequences of that is. Uh, Dr. Putnam's book uh, and the treatises from the Journal on Pediatrics all tell you about the fact that we should be encouraging recreational activities. And in fact, that's what this court has said. So I thought it was a nice little uh, way that this court's prior rulings on those kind of areas come back to weigh in on this particular case. So I don't think any duty should be extended to the recreational leagues. Thank you, sir. Counsel? Thank you. And may it please the court, Andrew Kirby uh, for the Pinks as respondents. Uh, I believe that the, uh, this court should affirm in all respects. What, what should they have done here? Uh, very simply, uh, self-execute uh, what was exactly in the zero tolerance but policy. But the zero tolerance po policy to me says you go to the coach, I'm presumably of the team whose spectators are uh, engaging in this behavior, and you tell the coach to deal with it, right? In this game, they had already thrown that coach out, right? <laughs> One of the coaches out, yes. Yeah. So they did that. They threw the coach out. They threw players out. They warned, I think there's evidence in the record, some spectators who were near the penalty box. And so isn't that a reasonable response to what was not at that point a physical altercation? Um, I think the point is, is well made, Judge, but I believe that would be an issue of fact for the, uh, as the fourth department said. Was the game over? Uh, the game had just ended, Your Honor. Uh, when, when, what's the tale on this? How, how long do they, does the hockey league have to... Well, I believe until everyone leaves the, the facility, really? um, or at least it leaves the stands. I mean, so they could have thrown them out of the game at that point? Well, I mean, it, 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 I think suppose it goes, they, it Suppose goes, they're fighting in the parking lot when they get out of the, you know, on their way out of the rink and heading to their cars. Well, let's get back to the point. If, if there was the verbal altercation, if there was a continuing hostile um, environment that the lower court and, and the uh, appellate division found existed, or at least a triable issue of fact, the onus uh, is on uh, youth hockey to uh, nip it in the bud. That's it's the entire the These, these are adults. I, 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 God bless them all. I, you know, I said enough for these rinks. But you're saying that, this, that the hockey league uh, had a duty uh, after the game 
to make sure everyone is, is out safely and in their cars uh, so that they don't yell and scream and shoot each other? Well, I'm, I'm advocating for the, the duty that existed under the facts of this particular case. This right. fight occurred immediately upon and as a result of the, uh, the bickering, the yelling, and the vulgarity that was traded between basically could two groups. Could have two occurred as a result of their coach getting thrown out, because I think this is relatives of their coach. But so it wasn't bickering as to the game. It could have been as a result of the, the throwing, throwing them out. But it seems that you have a very strong act. You have a criminal assault. Ricci, Ricci pled guilty to criminal assault. Right. So our case law, there's a case about a concert where there's an assault, and we say it wasn't the level of criminal activity that usually happened at concerts, so it broke the, uh, the causation or the duty change scope, however we want to phrase it. The appellate divisions have said that, especially, I think, third or fourth or just third with Syracuse University case. Right. So you have a criminal assault here. So what gives them this obligation based on the facts if we accept them for purposes of this motion? Uh, in that Syracuse O'Connor hockey game in which there was a sudden uh, described as literally seconds between the verbal um, uh, exchange that preceded the, uh, the uh, criminal assault. And in that case, the court held, and as they, I think should be held up in, in this court, there was not any indication a lapse of or a, a period of time in which that increasing hostility took place and it's that was yelling, the distinction in that case and that's a sudden assault but there's no one hear what you have again reading it in the light most favorable to to the other party you have people engaged in inappropriate behavior yelling taunting you know obscenities but it's a sudden fight that breaks out at the end of the game, exactly as one of the cases, and I can't think of which one particularly it is right now, where a player's coming off and this fight breaks out with a spectator. It was the Syracuse. That's the Syracuse conference. one, because then there's another one with a player and a, and a ref, and it's a sudden assault, but you're saying because we had parents yelling, and we've probably all been to games, engaging in behavior that's offensive, clearly, they, this escalates to the point where you should have taken some measure to prevent a criminal assault. Well, I'll put it to you this way, Judge. In the, in the moving papers of the defendant, uh, the zero tolerance policy uh, that should and was not filed in this case uh, would have led to the ejection of the people who ultimately started this fight. Can that create a heightened duty? I don't believe it's a heightened duty, Judge. I think it's an industry standard that uh, USA Hockey is in the best position to monitor all their local sports associations had created, had recognized the problem. It's a very specific problem. It's that these verbal altercations at, these, uh, at, at every level of amateur hockey has led to numerous physical assaults occurring at games. Where, where are, are there any in, in this area that have ever happened? Or this Not in this record, Your Honor. Um, what, on the what, other I'm, what I'm mostly concerned about is um, exactly if there is this duty, how it is to be implemented. Because, you know, you have mostly, if not entirely, a bunch of volunteers. And you refer to the league, and the league has a duty and all this. But, but we're talking about people, okay? And, and if we're not talking about hiring security personnel, who has the authority to take some of the actions that you're that you're suggesting, and and um, and I'll just extend it in, uh, a little bit further. And how far do we take this? Is, does it apply to t-ball games? You know, uh, outside. You know, I'm not, where, I'm, where's the limit? I'm not a advocating for this, and I think what counsel tries to do is make me look like I'm. Uh, putting this huge burden on all you well, sports. Well, we uh, need to know that. Exactly. You know. I'm saying for this particular league that's under the umbrella of USA Hockey, they were told that you but have we to... we can't make a rule that applies to one league, I don't well, think. We have to make a, a more general rule, and I'm trying to, I'm trying I, to figure out where you think that rule should fall. I, I equate the, the, the common law of, of the cases uh, that I cited in my brief that all talk about the heightened tension going on through the game mirror exactly what the... Uh -huh. The duty that uh, the uh, and the purpose of the zero tolerance policy. But those cases well, mostly have hired security. That you know, the, well, the, the not, not necessarily. And, they, and they, the have, they have. They have. Some have to deal with restaurants. Some have to do with uh, uh, bars and discos. Uh, here, 
and, and I think it's very Council, uh, with the interesting. with zero-tolerance policy, how long does the altercation or the verbal back and forth have to go? Would it be one obscenity by one person and then that person is ejected? Or? Well, I think it's clear cut on, on the way they've, they've created it. And they know their, their fans and their spectators and their parents best. And they, their rule crafted for their, for their uh, participants. And but by can't the way, they give themselves a heightened standard? I mean, because you're talking about children, you know, these are 13-year-old players. Can't they say, if someone engages in obscenity, throw them out? But does that mean that, in, that creates a duty of, on them to, well, it's, that's going to lead to liability duty. for somebody taking a swing at somebody else? It's the same duty that we've recognized time and time again, where there's heightened, where there's a gathering of people. Um, in a public place that are invited to be there. And in this case, the people who are, are doing the, the, the violation of the zero tolerance policy are the parents who are part Wouldn't of these memberships. Wouldn't encourage them to have a not so zero tolerance policy anymore? Because we don't want our leagues to have liability. So we had this rule, we were trying to protect these kids, you know, bad behavior by parents, we understand it's a problem. But if that's going to give our volunteer organizations liability in every county, then you know what? We'll have a 70 percent tolerance policy. Well, I, th I think I want to go back none. to this particular record. After this incident took place, it was very interesting. The presidents of both associations, of both teams, investigated. Mr. Mercurio, who was the president of the Whitestown team, is no longer in the case, said the best solution going forward is we reiterate the policy, we designate one of our um, uh, uh, members to, to watch the uh, tournaments. They assist the coach and the refs to uh, take out the violative uh, uh, And who's participant. paying for that? No, no one. That's the beauty of it. Yeah, but the problem then is I all of a sudden say, gee, I'm supposed to be there tonight, but I can't. I've got some other meeting, and so there's nobody there, and therefore they violated that policy, and therefore they're liable when, you know, Well, if, if it up. comes up, if it comes up. Or and the person that they physically remove says, you, you know, charges them with assault. Right. Right. Well, what happens, and what Mr. Mercurio said, and it's at 1410 in the record, the, the procedure to follow is if they don't go, you shut the game down. You stop the game. You make that sound like it's so simple. And, and you know, you got all of these kids and all of these people. Let me, it seems to me that the person who got punched ought to be suing the puncher. And you settled with the puncher, I yes. believe. In the city of Rome. Yes. I believe point. they had the same duty that Mr. Kelly is now fighting. Well, that, but, uh, but and, and, and Mr. Mercurio said, if no, none of that works, simply call 911. Um, and couldn't any of the spectators have done that? They could have, and maybe the members should have done that. But all I'm saying is that when, when Rome Youth Hockey and uh, USA Hockey says this is a policy uh, that is effective in curbing a known uh, occurrence that is occurring during our games, I believe it doesn't heighten any duty. I believe it's the same duty that's been recognized over and over again. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Mr. Kirby? Thank you, Your Honor. I mean, Mr. Kelly, excuse me. Plaintiff wants us to be thrown into the special relationship master servant, uh, teacher, student situation. And that just shouldn't be done, and it's not a realistic way to format this. The fact that we had a zero tolerance policy. Uh, is merely not binding on us because that's what the Gilson versus Metropolitan Opera case said. We don't have a heightened duty, it's just a guideline. And of course, there is no proof of great violence throughout the land. When we did the zero tolerance policy, or should I say when USA Hockey did it, it was trying to just reiterate the rules of hockey about what's a penalty and what could happen and also tell spectators that there could be lots of assaults, but there aren't any. There's none in the record, there's no cases about it, and it was just merely trying to direct people's attention to proper behavior. That's it. The case uh, should be reversed, uh, and the plaintiff is not left without a remedy. It had its remedy, and that's been fulfilled. Thank you. Thank you.